morning. And very warm welcome to you all, whether you are regular worshipper or worshiping after visiting us after a long time or visiting us first time. You all are very welcome. And special welcome to all our audience and people watching us uh, from home. Um, a very special welcome to our guest speaker today, Dr. Johan Bukhawat. Is it right? <laughs> right. Um, is a chairman of WID. WID is an international community, a small charity in the UK coming alongside with the churches and leaders in Africa, Latin America, and Asia who want to innovate training, training that helps Christians transform the stories of their community. Johan is Dutch, live in Holland, is married, and he and his wife, Yvonne, have one foster child. Um, Himit Rana, who advises with um, on Pakistan, and today he accepted Rana's invitation to open the word of God for us. Today is a very, his visit here is a very relevant and special because of his work through this charity and community in Pakistan, which is helping Christians, especially in Pakistan, in lots of, <coughs> lots of ways. A friend of Pakistan from West, because today is Independence Day uh, of Pakistan. Pakistan declared a sovereign state following the British Raj 75 years ago today. So today is a very special day that you are with us on this special day. We are so pleased that you are with us. A friend of Pakistan from West. And another thank you I want to say to worship group who will be leading us and uh, Simon Large, who is uh, our technical hero. <laughs> um, yeah, and after the service, there will be a prayer team available in the Lady Chapel if anybody wants to spend time with prayer uh, on their own or with someone to pray for you and with you. So my name is Musina Rana. I am one of the worship leader here at St. Edmunds. And Rana, our rector, is taking services in uh, Brimmauer and Glengannada. He might come here, end of the service, we don't know. <laughs> so we'll see. So in a moment of silence, let's still ourselves. <coughs> to let God take place in our minds and bodies to speak and work. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, sing your praise with gratitude, and to listen to your word with eagerness through Christ our Lord. Amen. We start our, our worship by singing a beautiful hymn to bless our Lord who never leaves us nor forsakes us. The Lord who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. So we'll stand and sing, bless the Lord, O my soul.
Our appointed psalm this morning is Psalm 80. Psalm 80 is a corporate prayer. This musical prayer is a pleading for God to renew his blessing on Israel, which had been withdrawn due to God because of their because of nation's unfaithfulness. Because this psalm includes a beautiful prayer that I want to focus on, we hear this prayer three times in this psalm. This heartfelt plea, let your face shine, that we may be saved. This prayer is not only mentioned in this psalm, but throughout the Old Testament, we hear this plea from the different people, people of God the deep longing and yearning of the Jewish people within a constant stream of hardship, difficulty, persecution, gave voice to all humanity. In other words, the bearing of the Jewish soul as the people of God is the crying out on behalf of us all. God, who is our faithful Father, who always keep his promises, has answered the prayer of Psalm 80 and let his face shine on us. He did it through Jesus. So how are we going to say this psalm? I will say the two verses and please respond in the repeated prayer which is mentioned in verses 3, 7 and 19. And you will see that on the screen in bold. So please respond the bold uh, verses. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might. Come and save us. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. Restore us, Lord, and make The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty sea down with its branches. Its branches reach as far as the sea, it shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass by pick its grapes, boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feed in it? Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine. The root your right hand has planted. The sun you have raised up for yourself. Your wine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. The son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. Throughout the day, we can utter. Stir up your power, O God, come to save us. The intention of saying it repeatedly is not to get God's attention because we already have, but the purpose is to connect us with the divine resources for deliverance, to be in constant touch and continual communion with the one and only faithful God who can ultimately restore, renew, revitalize, and reform the world with justice and righteousness. So let's sing another hymn, Faithful One, So Unchanging. So we stand and sing the hymn.
Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now is the time to confess before God, with the people of God, to our brokenness, to the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world, the grace of God drawn upon the world with healing for all. In a moment of silence, let us come to him in sorrow for our sins, seeking healing and salvation. So we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let everything be said and done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Give giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Let us sing to God with thankful Open our lips, Lord. And so, expressing our gratitude to God, we will continue His praise by singing another hymn, Blessed Be Your Name. <coughs> Would you please stand?
We are all in one Jesus Christ. We belong to him through faith. He is of the promise of the spirit of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. So let us share peace with each other by waving or whatever way you can adopt. going to bring our readings. Good morning. We're going to turn to our Bible readings now. Um, if you would like to follow the Old Testament and the Hebrew reading in your pew Bibles, if you have sight of them, I'll give you the numbers as we go along. So we're starting with Jeremiah chapter 23, and here Jeremiah is bringing God's prophecy to the people of Judah. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord. Sorry, this is page 783, Jeremiah 23. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer, that breaks a rock in pieces. Our Hebrews reading is on page 1,210 of the Pew Bibles. And this is Hebrews 11, and we're beginning at verse 29. So you may remember that last week we read the first part of Hebrews 11, and the story of Abraham in faith moving on and the story of Moses and now we continue in verse 29 with other people in the Old Testament who went by faith in God Hebrews 11 29 by faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land but when the Egyptians tried to do so they were drowned By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and all the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again, There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, 
and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And now these well-known verses from the beginning of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> and our gospel reading from Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 49. Listen to the Gospel of Christ according to St. Luke. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus here talking about what the kingdom will look like. <clears throat> I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it was already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Jesus said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. I just had a word with Beth and we agreed I could take off my coat. <laughs> it's so nice to be in your midst. Uh, we arrived Thursday and uh, I have been asking directions to Rector Road. Everybody knows. <laughs> then I get the explanation and it's not always easy then to follow the directions. So I asked more. And several times we got invited to tea. If that's so typical of your community, you are in a wonderful, not just surrounding, but in a wonderful town, village, what shall I call it in English? Town. town. My English has been distorted by my community with many American colleagues. <laughs> 
So I hope you can forgive when I say things that do not sound right. I'll do my best. Now, when it comes to Welsh, I've seen many of your streets. I loved to try to pronounce them. But um, I'm from uh, a country, the Netherlands, that um, if, uh, I mean, if I would there on the street ask for directions, there is no rector road in no village, in no town in Holland. So if I'm telling them I'm going to church, almost 99% will think that I'm ready coming from the Middle Ages on my way to the asylum ward. <laughs> I think that is so similar to the days of Jeremiah. I mean, we read it, and the words Baal and uh, the prophets, I mean, apparently, they were religious leaders. But they were telling in those days that faith was in all kinds of popular ways like the neighbors, the fellow citizens, the other countries, much like the world, we say in New Testament terms. In Holland, I would call it liberal. But it's so hard to identify that when, like in my country, you're in the middle of it. Uh, I live in the Bible Belt of Holland. There, on Sunday morning, there are traffic jams going to 20 different churches with congregations over a thousand. They're considered to be the remnant of the Middle Ages in my country. But that's the town where I live in. But now I get to know so many of my neighbors. I resonate with what our Lord Jesus says in the passage we read. Faith does not equal going to church, doing all, even the most orthodox rituals. And as a matter of fact, when you visit another church, you can be even expelled from one church because of your association. And I have got neighbors who tell me almost with tears that their daughter married someone from a different church. Imagine. But when it comes to real faith, I have a soft spot with them because they think I'm a pastor which I am, but they think that the true faith really is with them. But there is no certainty of the Word of God, there's no reading of the Word of God, there are rituals on the outside. And you see that division that the Lord Jesus talks about, even among the most conservative circles. Because true faith doesn't equal how you relate to the world or true faith isn't equal to, to, to doing the right things or going to church. So if we look at Hebrews 11 and you see there true faith defined, it has a very different effect on me. I don't know if when you read that passage, you might want to do so again at home. It is marvelous. Rahab, maybe not so. But the rest of the names, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Yefta, David, Samuel, I cannot read them as well as you did. <laughs> Excellent reading. But those people are like heroes of faith. And when you read that they're sawn into two and they invited death, I mean, the one thing I understand is when it says they did not receive what was promised to them, yet their life was in a lifestyle here and now because of what was coming. I was listening to the radio on my way to the ferry coming here and it was a Christian broadcast and the Christian broadcast, the, the lady said something that I resonated with. She said, it's so interesting, the people who live a lifestyle that's attractive usually are the people that are convinced that in this life there's no happiness, it is in the life coming. And everything in this life is preparing us for that. I think that's what, in other words, is what the author of Hebrews is saying that marks all those people. But those people are so special. I mean, you've read Abraham and Moses last Sunday. 
Maybe what I'd like to do this morning and leave with you is not maybe pick out another hero. And we look at the heroes and it strengthens that we may never attain their choices of lifestyle here and now. We are normal people, aren't we? What makes us believers like them? And it's good to have an ideal. But what I like about the scriptures is that they give so many details about some of the believing saints that are chosen to be in the Bible and their lives are described that I can identify with them. So if I learn anything about faith from those saints and when there's more information in scriptures, I see a process how their faith developed. And it's nice to look at the end, like with Abram, when he is willing to sacrifice Isaac. Wow! But I can relate to Abram far more on the pages before, on his first steps. And I'd like to zero in on maybe three aspects of his faith that grows. And I hope you can resonate with all three. I think the first typical step of obedience belonging to faith is visible when Abram is called, right? Everybody knows he's called from Ur, some think he's called from Raharon, you need to read carefully, compare scriptures with each other. But he left in an area where people were liberal, to put it in modern terms, believed in many gods, had many ideals, and he encountered the one and only God. And he stepped out. He obeyed when God said, go leave your family, leave your network, leave your country. You see him leave his country. You see him leave his network. So if you look carefully, and if you dare to ask questions reading scriptures, you wonder, did he leave his family? Did he? Now in those days you had extended families, like in some cultures, in some countries. That's not like our, what we have is called nuclear family. Strange phenomena. We're used to it. And then you have the world where you can have more than one wife. We may have that too, but we have them after each other. And in other parts of the world you have them at the same time. And it's okay. It's even a token of wealth and so I mean, Abraham is more from that world. You know? And it doesn't surprise when you see his lifestyle some things that we don't recognize. But I do recognize his step of faith to obey and go and leave his country. But I tell you, when I come home after this trip, and when God in this maybe service or at another moment in the meeting speaks to me and says, I'm calling you, Johan, to go and leave your country, leave your network, leave your home, and go to a place and I will not tell you which yet. And I tell my wife, you know what she will say? She will say, oh, God hasn't spoken to me yet. <laughs> Go where? And he either convinced her, but they went. And the funny thing is, we read as if we are not careful in reading for details. We read all the necessary information because they didn't have children. And my wife and I were waiting for over 10 years in our marriage, one or two miscarriages, before we were ready to have a foster child in our home. So I tell you, in those days, if I had mentioned that God called me to leave country, network, and family, and I would have said, but he promised we would get children when we arrive, my wife would have packed the suitcase before I even had started. There's an interest. There's always a reason why we step out in obedience, isn't there? <laughs> There's benefit now for some reason because of whatever background we have, whatever. Usually we are in a growth spurt in our faith when things are not going well in our lives. Isn't that true? It's an awkward dynamic. And here you see Abram choosing to go, but he has a motive. So you can go on in this story. I mean, when they get there, what did he do? 
He, he, he stayed for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years in Haran. Became even wealthy there until his father passed away. He had not left his father. He only went on when his father passed away. That is normal in an extended family situation. And whether he's the youngest or the oldest, you can research that. But that was the duty that Abraham obviously had to care for his father. So he went on, and who did he have with him? Lot. And if you read again, what you see is Lot's father, a brother of Abram, had passed away. And one of the children became a bride within the family. And the other, you know, Lot became a foster son of his uncle and aunt. Network fostering, we call that in our language. It's normal. So of course he took Lot with him. But the moment it come, they become wealthy, what a blessing or oh, what a problem. It became a problem to them. The family business was so big, there was not enough land for the cattle. So they, they, they split and then God, when, a, when, when, when Abraham said to Lot, you go and choose. Then God appeared to him and said, and this is the land I'm going to give you. And in this land, you will become a nation. But you know, I think the climax comes, that obedience of Abraham. When at some point, you know, he had won a victory and, and, and here comes our Lord and says to him, you know, I will be your shield, I will be your reward. And then he says, okay, what about my servant? Is he going to inherit? Will your promise work through my servant? God says, no. Go look at the stars. Count the sand of the sea. <coughs> That's how many will be your descendants. And it says, Abram believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Amen. But that's growth through moments of obedience. But we have skipped some passages. Because what you see, his growth comes not just with obedience, but with stepping on the wrong foot. <laughs> Is that English? Making wrong moves. Falling off the path. I don't know how to say it. Abraham, the moment he was in the heart of the will of God, in the land that was going to be populated by his descendants, there was a famine. How can you be in the center of the will of God? How can you have obeyed and you are doing it because of getting a benefit and then the benefit isn't there? And there's even a famine. Usually when problems start, we start wondering whether we are in the will of God, whether God is with us. We always think that in blessings or advantages or good things, we know God is affirming, but when things go bad, how will we stand? He doesn't. He moves south and there he is and he gets an audience with Pharaoh and he must have been briefed and he says to Pharaoh, this is my sister. And Pharaoh doesn't negotiate, you know, the, the, the how do you call that? When you want to buy a bride? The, the, there, yeah, that. <laughs> he just takes Sarah and makes Sarah part of his harem. And here he is he, in the south, not in the land God called him. And his wife, how will he get children? Is in the harem of Pharaoh. And you see it going on and on. Abraham trying to take care of what God promised in his own way. I tell you, uh, to me, the least appealing moment is when Sarah says to Abraham, well, the neighbors do it. Your competitors do it. Everybody does it. Add Hagar to your harem. And the child that's born from Hagar will be your son and God will fulfill the premise. That's not something a man doesn't understand. And Ishmael is born. And what, lo and behold, does Abraham get? Jealousy between two women. They fight. I tell you. Then, when Isaac is born, the two boys 
fight. Sometimes, you know, when we arrange and fix things, it gets worse, does it not? Rather than to tough it out. This may be a different culture than ours. But I can look back at mistakes I made, and some of us have made mistakes, and we're still living with them, right? They don't go away. We live with the consequences of our choices, don't we? But if true faith grows through obedience, it grows, but through obedience, it is not without so many mistakes, even with consequences of mistakes staying with us. But maybe the most remarkable is the third aspect. That is, Abraham's growth of faith comes to a climax when God says to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there. I cannot relate to this passage. Can you? It's not just a different culture. I don't get it. He stands up, probably early in the morning, not because he wants to obey right away. He didn't go through Haran for six years, you know. <laughs> it was not a long process. He went, probably early in the morning, to not tell Sarah. <laughs> I don't know what was on it. He did go. It's amazing. I cannot identify in this point of my life with Abraham. But I tell you this. When I go back, what I see is what I try to capture in the tone. Your son, the one you love. God is so close to Abraham when he's asking something. There is a relationship that developed over the years that made the voice of the Lord, even the whisper of the Lord, a message that Abraham recognized. I mean, it started when he had to leave his network, his family, his home, his country. God, I would call that grace. God took the initiative. There's no faith in Abraham without God's initiative. And then when he, in Egypt, thinks of his white lie, you know, and he's stuck without wife. Who saves him? Who fixes the situation? It's God taking him and Sarah back. It's God who comes to him after his big victory and tells him, I'll be your reward. I'll be, I mean, probably Abraham was thinking, my goodness, in a moment of fanaticism, I let go of all that I could have kept as what I gained in this battle. And what about my own life? Five kings will come. I mean, if you read the story, when God says, don't fear, someone is fearful. When God says, I'll be your reward, someone is making calculations with his calculator. And God speaks to him, and then Abraham believes. It's God, initiative. Our faith grows, of course, in steps of obedience, with so many mistakes. But it's God at the beginning, God in the middle. I tell you, and the most surprising part for me is where God says to Abraham, with all that fighting going on in his home, and I tell you, our son, 21 now, is not doing well. Because of privacy and, you know, we're streaming, I will not go into the details. But I've talked to some of you and I've heard some of the stories in your. I mean, we are most vulnerable with our children, aren't we? And God working in Abraham's life, it's a child where most of the lessons of faith come from. It's to get a child that made him obey. It is to trust God without having a child that made him be justified. But it is him trying to fix it. And I mean, it's children, children. And here when he's got wives fighting, and then he's got the children fighting, it's God who says, Send them away. Can you put yourself in his sandals? Sending? I think he has grown to love 
not just Ishmael, his own child, but Hagar. Send them away. The most difficult decisions. God is there. And when we let go and cannot control what's happening, we read God taking care of Hagar in the desert, taking care of Ishmael in the desert. We know nations have grown out of it. God is present. It's his grace. And he, and that's the beautiful passage of Genesis 22, and we all know it, he takes care even of the sacrifice, because Abram doesn't have to bring the sacrifice. I cannot imagine what it is when Isaac says, Dad, here is fire, and here is uh, the wood, and here's the knife. Where is the lamb? And Abram, who fixes things all throughout his life, we hear him say to his own son, God will provide and the two continue together and again it says the two continued together it's where I am right now not because I have two wives <laughs> not because I have two sons but we have a different situation you have your own situation you may be in Genesis 15 in your life of faith you may be in Genesis 12 I invited I think over the last two days, ten people to come to church. <laughs> they didn't come. <laughs> you know, you're doing it well with your coffee, you know, going out. <laughs> and the green man has come. I, I've learned a lot of things about your community. So many opportunities, but you see everybody. Everybody knows each other. You are fortunate, you know, to be so close to so many people in such a community. But I tell you, we see each other and we all grow by the grace of God. And he speaks in our lives when things are difficult. He speaks when we make mistakes. And if you are at the point of your life of Genesis 22, at the end of this service, when we are drinking the famous coffee, do come to me and give me your phone number. <laughs> because I might need to call you in the coming few weeks or months. Because I don't understand Genesis 22. But I don't need to stand here preaching understanding as if I know. This is not a place for heroes. <laughs> it's God who builds and grows true faith. Amen. That was powerful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Johan. <clears throat> so let's stand to affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty. sitting uh, before Rennie and Melanie bring into session. Just to prepare ourselves to cry out to the Father for his mercy and love that we have received through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to sing, Who Can Stand?
So the collect for today. Almighty God, who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church, open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Renny and Melanie will bring her to session. Renny is going to read a very short story uh, which is relevant to our prayers. <coughs> this is called the Silversmith's Story. There was once a group of women studying the book of Malachi in the Old Testament. As they were studying chapter 3, they came across verse 3 which says, he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. This verse puzzled the women and they wondered what this statement meant about the character and nature of God. One of the women offered to find out about the process of refining silver and get back to the group at their next Bible study. <clears throat> that week, this woman called up a silversmith and made an appointment to watch him at work. She didn't mention anything about the reason for her interest beyond her curiosity about the process of refining silver. As she watched the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were hottest as, <clears throat> as to burn away all the impurities. The woman thought about God holding up, <coughs> holding us up in such a hot spot. Then she thought again about the verse, that he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the whole in front of the fire the whole time the silver was being refined. The man answered yes and explained that he not only had to sit there holding the silver but he had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time it was in the fire. If the silver was left even a moment too long in the flames it would be damaged. The woman was silent for a moment then she asked the silversmith, how do you know where, when the silver is fully refined? He smiled at her and answered, oh, that's easy, when I see my image in it. If today you are feeling the heat of this world's fire, just remember that God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ are refining you. You are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Thank you, Rennie. Let us pray. As we pray, can I invite you to unclasp your hands and hold them loosely, upwards, palm upwards, in your lap. This is an attitude of giving and receiving, that we may be listening as we pray to the Lord. The response will be, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of heaven and earth. Nothing is hidden from you. You know our deepest secrets. You have watched over us as any <coughs> earthly dad would do from the day of our conception. You have watched our development, our struggles as we strive towards maturity. You know, Lord, how hard it is to find our path in this world. 
You understand the things that claim our attention instead of you. You know the lies that the world would tell us and those we tell ourselves. <coughs> Yet your desire is for us to know you more, to be part of our lives, part of our struggles. Help us, Lord, to talk to you more, to ask you for direction and expect to receive it. Help us, Lord, to walk by faith and not by sight and to be your people here in Krikau. Help us, Lord, to reflect your love to those we meet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for the world. The news is often not good and depressing. We pray for relations between nations that aggressors will back down and allow tensions to ease. We pray for the China-Taiwan situation, for the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which is also shadowed by the Russia versus the West tensions. We thank you, Lord, for peaceful resolution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray about the problem of global warning, warming, Lord. If we have tried to ignore it in the past, it cannot be passed by this summer. Not only the usual places are affected, but it is now on our own doorstep, here in Europe and the UK. Heavenly Father, we pray for wise heads to prevail in industry and politics, in countries around the world that everyone will recognise the damage we are doing to your beautiful creation and our world. Help us to act, Lord, before it is too late. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. <clears throat> we pray for our country at this difficult time. Our new Prime Minister, will be chosen by a select group to lead the nation and most of us have very little to say about it. Heavenly Father, we pray for great wisdom and courage for the candidate who will be chosen. Help them to remember they are Prime Minister for a nation and not just a party. Grant them ability to make the right choices for this country in the coming months. As the cost of fuel and food escalate alarmingly, it will put many people into intolerable debt and poverty through no fault of their own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for our own local area of the Usk Valley the Brecon Beacons and the Black Mountains. We pray for help for our farming community during the heat wave and the drought. Help them, Lord, to save their farms, livestock and crops from the disaster of fire and water shortage. Bless them, we pray, as they bless us with good food. Please send rain in moderation that animals may be watered crops nourished, rivers and reservoirs fill up again. Help us, Lord, to be wise towards wise stewards of the gifts you have given us. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for our community here in St Edmunds. We thank you for Rana, our rector, Messina, his wife, and their family. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them with wisdom and authority, equipping him for leading this church and the ministry area during this coming year. 
We pray for our fellow churches in the ministry area. Bless them, we pray, and help us all in the coming months to assist our communities during the difficult times to come. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who are not well. Restore them and refresh them to health and strength. We pray for the blessing of the Holy Spirit to be upon them. Heavenly Father, we, remain, we remember all those who have recently passed into your presence. We remember them with love and affection. We pray for their families, asking you to comfort and bless them. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. <coughs> Amen. Let us now say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Both. Um, now is the time for notices. Can I ask Sally? Sally has some things to share. Last October, I stood here with um, the Bible Reading Fellowship's centenary. Uh, reflections. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm a priest here. I'm an Anna chaplain, which is um, a ministry to older people in the community providing spiritual care with a, a great many of the pastoral visitors here. And I am the Anna chaplaincy lead for Wales. Um, when I stood here in October last year and said that uh, the Bible Reading Fellowship, which Anna chaplaincy is part of, had written uh, this book for the year. Um, several people bought a copy and um, I have had feedback that uh, several people also in this congregation have found those Bible readings very helpful. Today I'm here to uh, publicise uh, the Bible reading uh, notes that they have for older people. Um, they're, they're what the Bible Reading Fellowship are known for are their Bible reading notes. And um, I'm bringing your attention to the autumn edition, mainly because uh, not only does it talk about uh, things from the beginning of life to the end of life, but I have a contribution um, called Surviving Grief. There are 10 readings here from the book of uh, Ruth. Uh, where I reflect on the journey through grief. And um, if anybody would like a copy, then just as we did in October, if you would let me know, I would be very happy to obtain uh, a copy of this for you. They are £5.65, I think. £5.35. And um, I say, should anybody want a copy of those? I'd be very great. I would be very happy to purchase them on your behalf. So there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Another notice from Roger. Roger, would you come for the walk and talk? <laughs> it's uh, th this Thursday that Tad Daniel will be speaking at Patricia Church as uh, a, a guest of the ministry area. And uh, Tad Daniel is a leader of the Orthodox Church. He's a Welshman based in Blaenau-Festiniog and he has made a special study of the Welsh saints. 
And I think it will be absolutely fascinating to hear about these slightly uh, mysterious people who were the founders of the origins of the, the, the telling us of the roots of our church in Wales. And that's at two o'clock at Patricia Church. And uh, immediately after the talk, from the preaching cross outside the church, we shall be setting off on a walk. Some of us will. Those who like hill walking will be able to walk from Patricia back to Lambeda, where there's also a preaching cross, which will be the finish of our walk, about two hours, about four miles, including going over the top of Krugmar. So um, if, if you're thinking of coming on the walk, do come to the walk, to the talk, prepared for the walk. And there are, there are more details in the, 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 the talk, which is Walking with Saints, that's the name of the talk, and also a supplementary note, a walk as well as a talk. And those two flyers are at the back of the church. So if you're interested, either in the talk or in the talk and the walk, uh, do pick up the flyer as you go out. And can I just say, as, as a practicality, that it will be very helpful for the walkers to have a lift from Lambeda Church to Patricio Church so that their cars are back at Lambeda when they have finished the walk. And also, it will save some of the pressure on parking, which is not easy at Patricio Church, um, if you can either car share or, if you're not going on the walk, just call at the car park at the Village Hall in Lambeda on your way to Patricio uh, and see if there, any, anyone would like a lift. I shall be there. So um, do, do, do have a look at the flyers and I shall be having coffee afterwards. If you have any queries, do please ask one. Thank you. <coughs> Just another thing. Um, our church is open every Saturday, 40 in coffee, to welcome visitors and all of you, if you're free. Uh, lovely cakes here and um, they have raised so far 600 and something? Yeah, 634, so yeah, within two weeks, so with two days, yeah. That's great. Right, okay, so that's it really. So we sing our, so we sing our last hymn, Who Paints the Sky? So would you please stand?
So let's end our service with grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And please do stay for tea and coffee. Thank you.